so I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive, Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I see like five or six people that are falling out um, asleep right now. Uh, the thing is, I'm here basically to scare you, so hopefully they'll wake you up. Um, secondly, um, we have like 30 minutes, or supposedly, uh, to talk about 20 tips uh, to make your Rails application secure. So I'll try to be fast, I'll try to scare you. And after, if you have some questions, uh, you, you have my Twitter account there, so it's a faster way to find me unless uh, if you don't see me here on the halls or something. All right, um, well, uh, Red Hat is the company that I work for. I work, uh, Red Hat, first off, is not just an operating system, as uh, I've heard some people here commenting. It's, uh, it, it has a wide range of, um, of systems management solutions and well, anyway, it's a great place to work. If you guys want to work, you have a booth there. Uh, you can uh, work remotely. I work uh, from Madrid. Um, let's get started. Um, I tried to divide the talk on uh, types of vulnerabilities, and we're going to start with easy ones, which is, well, with easy to fix ones, and, well, maybe that's not the best option because that's not going to scare you so much and you're not going to wake up, but. Uh, I'll try. Okay, so first tip, uh, never use get to modify, simple one. Um, I, I've, well, first time I heard about this, I was like, well, why not? Uh, it's because it doesn't make sense to like modify or delete an object with a, with a get request. Um, it, it, it's because it's not like a good rest practice, where it's not just that. Um, I, I, ho I know some of you already know this, but bear with me because we'll try to dive into into these, into these uh, things a lot deeper. Um, so the problem with using get for modifying, destroying, or patching, or whatever, uh, your resources is that uh, when you put, uh, when you use a, a URL like that, let's say you have a web application example.com uh, that has some projects, and uh, you destroy them by accessing that URL, and maybe checking the, that the cookie is valid and the user is authenticated, you can put that, uh, well, someone can put that on their website and that will be loaded automatically. That's the basic, most simple example of cross-site scripting. So anytime someone's, someone does that, um, the, well, the, um, I can send you a link, you, your browser will load automatically that and the attacker would have deleted that project uh, through, uh, through a new server without you, n without you knowing at all. Um, same goes for editing things, like passing parameters um, to edit stuff. It, it, it basically suffers from the same problem. So uh, a real example, if you guys want to take a picture, um, uh, traffic in LA was, well, traffic lights in LA were possible to change, uh, like, I think it's 15 years ago, uh, by doing something like that. It's, it's, it's obviously not that. Don't try it. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, but actually, there's a small documentary about it uh, at that URL. Uh, so the solution is pretty simple. Just use put, post, patch, and uh, delete. Um, and the reason is, is what I said before. Um, because in that case, this URLs uh, will be loaded automatically as well, but they will be loaded, like the, a GET request will be, uh, will be sent to these URLs, and since no GET request, sorry, no uh, route exists for, for these, then it's just not going to do anything. Um, well, I kind of lied to you before, because put, post, and patch requests can also be triggered automatically. And this is one, like the first one, probably 90% of the people here were aware of, aware of uh, but maybe this, well, uh, but maybe uh, this one you were not. So a common t attack would be doing something like this. You would make a image, a giant one uh, of 30, 100,000 pixels wide, 
and you put some JavaScript on it that when you put your mouse over it, which is basically impossible to not do, uh, unless you have your mouse on, on the browser um, menu or something like that, uh, it will trigger this JavaScript. This JavaScript sends a put request uh, that changes a password in, in that URL, example.com user admin. If you send this, a page that contains this, to um, a person that has a cookie that, authentic that allows um, that person to be authenticated within example.com, then the password will change. Um, so there you go. Um, how do we protect ourselves again against this kind of attacks? Well, thank thanks to the Rails team, um, this was solved a long time ago. Um, I think I don't know if it, if it's on Rails two, but it's definitely on Rails three. Uh, you just put protect from forgery on your application controller or on any, on any controller that you want to protect. But I would just put it on application controller and offer some strategy. In this case, I'm just protecting with an exception. How does protect from forgery work? Okay, I know this. If, if you didn't hear about this before, it's going to sound like uh, nonsense. But the way it works is that all put, patch, um, post, uh, and delete requests will need to come with, a, with an authenticity token. This authenticity token um, will be checked. And, when they, and if the authenticity token uh, is, not, um, is not the one that the, that the, um, that the server wa uh, wanted, like in that case, example.com would have needed an, an authenticity token, uh, it will handle the unverified request in whatever way you want it. You can write methods for it. You can fail with an exception. It doesn't really matter. If it works, sorry, if it comes with an authenticity token that is, that is fine, then you just execute the request. So if, you, if we go to the example before, we're not sending any authenticity token, so it's not going to work. Um, that would be in the f.data part of, of, of this uh, little JavaScript. All right. Um, so another one that you might be aware of, uh, how many people here use scaffolding for creating Rails applications? Uh, OK, I see a few hands up. Um, scaffolding has this thing that it generates XML and JSON renders. Um, most people are aware of this and really remove them quickly because you, you can basically get uh, JSON and XML information um, about your resources for no, uh, without it being protected or whatever. Uh, it's like if you're not using it, just why have it? Why would you have it in your code? Uh, this is not the real problem. The real problem is when you want to use this JSON and XML resources. So let's say you have a webmail application. Okay, you're writing um, a webmail client, and your webmail client uh, needs to show an inbox, and you happen to encounter this user who has a million emails on, on, their, on an inbox, and you say, okay, it's taken two minutes to load the page. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, load these messages through jQuery or, or something. Um, so you say, okay, I'm going to serve the messages uh, over an authenticated, um, over an authenticated um, URL, and I'm going to serve them uh, over JSON, and I'm going to fill a diff with that. In this case, I, I would be filling like a messages diff with the uh, inbox messages. Well, that sounds fine, right? It would it would make the page load a lot faster. Uh, but you got to be aware that we're falling in the get trap that I was mentioning before. Um, an attacker can simply put that in in their website, and they will be fetching. Your, your well, that user messages uh, very easily and do whatever they want with that, because you're not in control of uh, of what happens in in an attacker's website. So it makes phishing as simple as this. Uh, you can just let's say Twitter, because I, 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 um, a lot of people here use Twitter. Twitter. Uh, I just tell you, hey, person. Um, Look at what they, wrote, what they wrote about you in here. And you send them a page. They just open it. They didn't have to do anything. Thanks for your inbox. <laughs> so very simple. It's a very simple phishing um, attack. Uh, a solution that I, that I like and that I use is uh, implementing secure headers, which is, um, 
it's a lot more than this. It protects you from loading content from other pages. So in this case, um, the request that we were talking about before, the, um, um, sorry, that example co example inbox messages uh, would need a header, sorry, would refuse to serve that content because it's not coming from your website. Uh, and it also comes with a lot more protections. Uh, it basically allows you to, to write policies uh, about how your content should be served. Um, so I recommend it. Um, you just install it and it comes with uh, by default very sane policy. If you need to relax it, think, it, think about it twice. Um, let's move into this one. This one is, is actually really fun to, to I mean, if, if you find this vulnerability, uh, it's like a, the jackpot. It's the luckiest thing ever for an attacker. Um, so how does this work? You have a website, and let's say when you're logging out, you may want to tell the user, hey, goodbye. Okay, you don't have that user information. Well, you have that user information, so you think, okay, maybe instead of saying goodbye user, uh, I have the user name, so let's just take it. So I pass the name through the URL or something, and I pass it like this, and I say, render goodbye uh, user. Uh, Daniel, for instance. Um, that is almost fine. Um, I don't know if anyone sees a problem with this yet. Uh, no. The problem is that plain render, uh, like render like that without passing a hash, uh, it, it takes a hash as an argument. So if your params contain a hash, and that hash, uh, it's the usual thing that you see, like t render text, and then the value would be uh, text on re render inline, the value would be R R uh, ERB or something like that. So if you, don't, if you don't pass the hash, that hash is going to be the parameters. So an attacker can simply uh, make a request to that URL, passing a parameter with a hash. I don't know if you guys see what's in there, uh, but it's the equivalent to this. So it's passing a hash uh, with the parameter inline with some ERB code. ERB code is not rendered at the client. It's, well, it's rendered at the client. It's not, um, well, it runs on the server first. The server evaluates what's in, the, um, in, in that ERB code. And the server will try to run that. Um, OK, did I scare you with that? Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> So I don't know what's the ca the use case for plain render. So just if you guys have have an actual use case for this, I would really like to hear it because I I couldn't find any example for it. So I'm just going to go for uh, suggesting using directly the text inline or whatever option there and just pass the params and it will be sanitized. It will be just fine. Um, if you're passing the params directly and you're not using the hash syntax, you you might fall into this really easily. Um, okay, um, so that was, that was uh, part of it. Let's dive into SQL injection, which is a very, uh, well, we have this notion in Rails uh, that we're protected by the framework somehow. I don't know who told us that, uh, that uh, we didn't have to do anything to protect ag ag ourselves against uh, SQL injection because our, our strings are somehow sanitized uh, by default or something when you pass them to SQL finders. I'll show you. Um, there are at least 20 methods that I'm sure that each and every person here that uses Rails uh, is using, and they're all vulnerable to SQL injection. Um, let's start with a simple example use case. Um, you have a website with users. How many people here have a website with user, the user model? OK. Almost nobody. No, I'm kidding. Literally everybody. So, um, so your users might might lose their passwords. Uh, when when your user loses a password, you might uh, want to provide them with a mechanism to get that password back. Um, if you, if they want to get that password, maybe you send them an email to their with with a with a token that identifies that user, 
and when they click on a URL that contains that token, they, they're prompted with like a form that contains a password and a password confirmation, right? That's a very common pattern, I think. Um, I'm sure people here have implemented this pattern. So that, that would be the token. It, it, it should be a lot longer than that, but I just so it fits on the slide, I had to do it like this. So I'm an attacker and I say, oh, I'm going to try with the first option that I have, uh, zero. Why, why do you think that's going to happen? Um, what's going to happen here? Well, it's just not going to find, it's going to return probably 404. Uh, the token doesn't exist, right? That's the usual. Uh, notice the small difference there. Instead of passing a string, uh, I'm a little bit uh, naughtier, and I decide to send the integer. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's going to find the token? Um, let's say that a token like, like 23A982 exists. Do you think that one is going to match? Well, you'd be surprised. Um, let's say your reset um, password um, method in the controller looks, or in the model, uh, the controller, <laughs> looks like this. Uh, you call find by token, right? And you pass the, the, the token that comes from the user, right? Well, this is an attack uh, vector that is open in all versions up to Rails 4.2, okay? Um, find by token, params user token, that's vulnerable because you're, that's vulnerable when you send something that is not the type, the same, yeah, the same type as the token. So if the token is a string and you're sending an integer, you're messing this up. And I'm going to show you how in a moment. Um, this is normally what happens, right? If I send a string, uh, Active Record will generate this query. So like reset token from users, where reset token is equal to zero, to zero string, right? And it's not going to find anything because there is no such string. The problem is with the type casting. If you're um, if you're strings, um, they contain any character, like in this case one AC or whatever, uh, they will be casted. They'll be casted to zero because SQL um, casts uh, uh, will cast uh, strings that contain characters to zero uh, when you try to cast them to an integer, and an attacker can simply do this. Uh, reset token equals to zero. Well, reset token will be a string that contains a character. Reset token will be a zero. So it's same as, as this. What is this? This is basically removing the where condition. OK. So the solution is upgrade to Rails 4.2 plus, where Active Record uh, takes care of this, of this conversion before generating the query. And the workaround before that, because that, that, that might not be an option, it, it's not an option for me for sure, um, call to us and, or whatever, uh, do, you, do the cast in, in Ruby before uh, calling this kind of methods. Um, okay, did I scare you yet? No? Damn, I, I don't see people sleeping, so I guess we're, prog we're progressing. Um, another one is, um, when you're calling methods like where, find, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and these methods uh, are being called, and you're passing parameters to to these methods, and you're not using the sanitized version, which I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, you're making a huge mistake. Uh, how does this happen? Well, in that example. Uh, I'm trying to find a user whose name is equals to params name. That's a normal pattern. Um, how about if the params name uh, that I pass contains that? Um, well, it's going to close the, um, the quote, the single quote there, and it's going to render the, um, the name check basically useless because it's unless name is nothing or one, one is true, so false or true is equals to true. And it can be a lot uh, nastier than that. Like, you, you can do something like that. Dele don't ever call delete from without aware. <laughs> um, so how to fix this? Uh, simple, just, it, it's basically a word of caution. Uh, call, if you're, you're all aware of it, but I've seen a lot of instances where these methods are not called properly. 
uh, you might be ma making your work queries like that. Uh, just use the key value thing that, that is already there, uh, or use the wildcard with, um, with the question mark, which is also sanitized and protected. Uh, and these are all of the methods that I've seen that are vulnerable to this kind of thing in, in, Ruby, in Rails. Um, if you guys want to know how, check out this page, uh, rails-sqli.org. Uh, it contains a lot of examples. Okay, uh, I hope that one was interesting for you. Uh, sessions, we have like around 10 minutes. Um, first one is don't send Pretty much everyone here, I'm sure you guys are all good developers and you don't send data in cookies like um, like user ID, well, yeah, user IDs even, or um, anything that is personal because cookies can be intercepted. You're, you're basically, um, if you're using rail, Rails 3 or, or 2, uh, your cookies can be intercepted and they can be as simply decoded as this. You just Copy that script. It, it, that that one literally works. I have an alias for it on my on my computer, and every time I see a cookie that that I want to decrypt, I just uh, call this, and it will decrypt your your cookies in less than a than a second. Um, in Rails 4, it's a little harder harder than that. Um, if you have enough willpower, uh, I see people here from the army, so I guess they do. Um, <laughs> They, uh, you can see an example there. I, I don't want to delve into it, but it's it's more complicated. And they, if they steal your secret key in in Rails, they they can do it as simple or as simple as as the one in Rails three. Um, with session data in our hands, we can alter it trivially. How many people fell for this? Known? I hope so because it's not true. Uh, if you tamper with the uh, with the cookie, uh, Rails w will check. Um, We'll, we'll check that the signature is not uh, what it expected. Um, so um, it's not a solution for that. That's just like a practice uh, that you need to follow. But um, it's it's this is like it, it it's we'll see how the next problem needs this to be, to be solved. So try to store your your sessions in 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 your server as well. Try try to make your server aware of uh, the sessions that are running on your on, on your on your application uh, you can store store them on active record redis uh, memcache it doesn't really matter um, the problem is that with long running sessions I can simply like take that guy that's using a MacBook there I can go uh, to his computer open the web inspector copy the the um, the session, put it in a cookie. My, we'll copy the cookie uh, on a pen, on a um, yeah, on a USB drive, and send it myself, and that works. And I don't even need to do that if there's like an insecure network or something like that. I can do that over the network as well. So session IDs should be rendered unusable after some time, uh, because of what I said before. Uh, a solution for this is old browsers that are. Um, like less than 15 years old, <laughs> uh, support this uh, header expires uh, that will make the um, the cookie expire on on the client side, and also on the server side, you probably want to run some cron job or something like that to make sure uh, your your sessions are being uh, sweeped uh, swept. Um, okay, th th this one I think you'll like it because it if you want to attack a Rails application with this, it will allow you to basically. Uh, play around with the server. Um, so let's say you're offering a um, way for people to download PDFs um, that they have like maybe in their own, I don't know, in their own folder on, on, on the server or something, and you use this. You send file, uh, docs, and you pass a parameter doc name to fetch the PDF. Mm. The problem here um, is that parameters can also be uh, file in, indirect file references, as I as I write there. Uh, you can just pass dot dot slash and try to basically traverse the server the server file system easily. 
and that way they could try to uh, download other PDFs that they might suspect that are there. Um, how to fix this? Uh, again, it's it's uh, it's another case of good practices. You have to be aware of this. You have to sanitize uh, params doc name, or yeah, before calling this. Um, this one, I'm I'm almost sure that somebody in this room is falling uh, for this. You have a website with users. I, a lot of people here said that. Um, your users might have profiles. Uh, their profiles might contain things like a personal website URL. They might contain a block URL like that. Well, and when you want to display that to display that block URL, you might do something like this. Call link to, hey, that's my personal blog. That's the block URL that we have stored on the um, um, on the user model. Well, what's the problem with that? Right? It, it, it looks all the same. How, the problem is that uh, calling link to is equivalent to this. It's equivalent to calling, um, to setting a string that it's um, the string that is going to be displayed there, and the link is a HTML safe. HTML safe means that it's not going to be converted. Um, whatever the user puts in block ur URL, it's going to be executed. Um, so nothing really stops a user from setting block URL to something like this, and it doesn't have to. Be, it doesn't have to be alert hacked. It, it, it can be an actual hack. Um, but yeah, uh, what is the what is a way to fix this that um, a lot of people use? Simply validate uh, the URLs that are going that you're going to show in link to because. In this case, with a HTTP or HTTPS uh, regex, um, and even with that validation, you got to be careful. <laughs> uh, why you got to be careful? Um, because by default, um, we've been using, and th this is relatively fixed on Rails 4. Um, we've been using regexes that match um, on a per line basis. Um, so, if you try to validate something with a, if you try try to validate the protocol with a, something like this, um, the dollar sign in there will uh, stop at a jump line. Sorry, um, yeah. Um, so the thing is that as long as you have a new line and then HTTP, it's going to pass. Uh, Rails 4 warns warns us about this. It basically will tell you, hey, if you have a multi-line multi um, validation, uh, allow it uh, actively. But if, if you're not using Rails 4, then you you might fall in, into this. Um, so just use that. Um, capital A and lowercase z uh, match with the beginning of the string and the end of the string. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip this one because we have like three minutes, but basically sanitize any, well, okay, let's actually do it. Um, okay. Um, so this is an actual, an actual thing that, that, I, that I have in a, in, in a project that I work on. Uh, we have a API to make power operations on hosts. Uh, host could be like a virtual machine, a physical machine, it doesn't matter. So uh, users send an action that is a power action, like on, off, reset, uh, whatever. Um, and we call host.power that send that. Uh, well, sending or, yeah, running user parameters uh, is not like the safest thing ever, right? Um, because an attacker can supply something like this, eval whatever Ruby code. <laughs> And they can also, they, they can simply um, send a block that contains, well, not a block, uh, they can send an eval that is going to be run. Um, and we would have called dot send on that parameter very simply. Uh, this is, like, this is not a joke. Uh, Spree, which I don't know if someone uses here, but it's the most popular Rails e-commerce framework, uh, had a problem where you would get any orders on on an e-commerce that uses a spree. 
and you could you could pass literally that uh, as part of the search uh, parameter. You would pass kernel dot fork uh, and run a command, and it will work because it, there were there was no check in of what was being passed. So what is the fix for this? Um, try to avoid it. Um, make sure that if you're what if you're Sanitizing that input, which you shouldn't do, I think. I think you should try to whitelist it. But if you have to sanitize it, be aware that commands can be changed, 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 and um, in general, try to whitelist it in this kind of way. What we're doing here is just protecting that dot send call by um, protecting the dot send call by uh, making sure the parameters are one of these four or five strings that we know. Um, okay, so other, other kinds of problems that you might fall in, uh, and that makes 30 minutes now, so I'm going to be fast. Uh, problem number one, SSL version three is vulnerable. The protocol is vulnerable. It's not that any implementation is vulnerable. All implementations are vulnerable. So. Um, it falls into what's called a poodle attack, which may sound like Chinese or something, but it's it's not. Um, it's the the attack works this way: um, when TLS isn't available either on the server or in the client, the br the browser will start requesting um, a lower version of TLS and then SSL version three. 96.9 of the top 1 million websites by number of visits in the world are vulnerable to this. And this means that HTTPS is and is basically useless in, in this case because an attacker that can hack SSL version 3 uh, can also hack your website. Um, the way it works, it, it, it's basically if you have a man in the middle, they can force a downgrade. I'm not going to go into details, uh, but basically, it, it will be a series of requests um, asking for for a lower version of of TLS, and in the end, SSL version three, and in the end, uh, you're hacked. Um, a way to fix this is any requests, because this is not just at the Rails application level. This is also any request that you're sending in Ruby, and you're not passing these options, it's falling uh, into this trap. Like any request that doesn't have that option might be um, it, it, it might be downgraded to SSL version three. Um, what you can do, I, I, I used Apache and Nginx in this example, but it can be whatever. Um, you can protect this at the server level. You can make your server not serve anything that is not SSL uh, version, sorry, not serve SSL version three, and, and only serve TLS. Uh, I'm gonna go fast, okay, red bricks. Uh, I'm going to post this as a, uh, well, first the slides, and maybe in a week or so, or, or two, a uh, blog post. Uh, so I'll be fast. I have like only two left, I think. Uh, problem: brute force attempt. Um, how do how do you pr protect against this? Uh, uh, typical DOS attack. There is this gem uh, that is called rack attack, and you can basically protect protect your your uh, requests by limiting them um, in like by time or by number of uh, requests coming from a certain IP, okay? Uh, so in that case, I'm limiting all, all requests that are not to the assets um, in my Rails application. Uh, another stupid thing is that if you're offering your server version, you're basically telling your attackers, hey, I, I didn't upgrade, you can't attack me here. <laughs> um, so protect this, you can hide it on on Apache theme, WebRig, Nginx. Um, these are the, the headers that these servers use. Um, you can also override it in the application to some degree uh, by using the full headers as, as secure headers uh, uses. Um, and the two last comments is scan your app. Uh, that's, a screen, that's a screenshot of um, uh, the results of, uh, of running Breakman. Uh, Breakman looks for a lot of the things that I've said and a lot more and gives you a, a diagnostic uh, of what's going on in your application with regards to security. Uh, same for Dawn Scanner. Uh, you can check out that URL uh, and download, download them both and try them on your application. I recommend you put it on Jenkins or, 
or Travis or whatever you use for for CI. And I think this is the last one. Uh, scan also your dependencies because uh, if you have a hundred gems that your application depends on, uh, chances are you have holes in your application that are basically because of this. Uh, so subscribe your gems, su subscribe your gem file to Gemnasium, so you get like warnings warnings about um, deprecated gems and stuff like that. And also bundle audit, which is a gem that looks for CVEs that have run that have happened in your in your dependencies in your gem file. Um, just a disclaimer. Uh, writing, well, writing and talking about web security is dangerous, it's difficult. Uh, there's a chance that I got something wrong, um, even though I took a long time to work in this. So uh, if you want to correct me, if you want to warn me about something, uh, I would appreciate it. And that's it. Thank you. I hope I scared you. Thanks.